When I first started doing my Power Rangers vs Super Sentai videos, I never went into too much detail in them, as honestly I didn't really know how deep the rabbit hole went, and I actually thought I'd only end up doing one video, so that's why the original review was more of an overview of Zhu Ranger and then a brief overview of the entirety of Power Rangers as a franchise. And the two that followed were short reviews of the Sentais and didn't cover too much of the American series. But as we've gone further into this, I've tried to give a full comparison of the Japanese show and its American counterpart, and it's frustrated me that I never went into enough detail about the franchise that kicked it all off. So it's only right that we go back and revisit the show whose name I can never pronounce, Kyoru Sentai Zhu Ranger. I know, I'm painfully British, I'm sorry. But Haim Saban couldn't even pronounce it, so just roll back your anger a bit. This time we're doing it right. We're doing an all-in, full-fat, detailed comparison with Season 1 of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, which happens to be where we start our journey, so let's go. The show starts on a planet, we don't really know which one, other than it can't be too far away from Earth where two astronauts spot something shining in the distance. While they don't know what it is, one points out that it looks like a giant space dumpster. You know, a space dumpster. They open it up to release Squat, Babu, Finster, Goldar and Rita, before the astronauts then run away scared, presumably back to their ship. Don't leave! You'll miss my coming out party! Wow, Rita! That's very progressive to be that open in 1993. Good for you. I mean, you're also evil and want to destroy the Earth, but still, good for you. We then cut to a youth centre that is simultaneously a gym and juice bar, which couldn't be more, we're trying to be more wholesome than even Saved by the Bell is, if they tried. Which they did. We're introduced to Jason, Zack, Kimberly and Trini, who are all stupidly good looking and athletic, and Billy, who's a nerd. I mean, you've got to feel sorry for someone as nerdy as that. We're also introduced to Bulk and Skull, who are meant to be bullies, but are also essentially the comic relief for this season, and many more seasons to come too. Meanwhile, Rita has already reached Earth's moon and built a headquarters there. She's about to spend at least three seasons failing to do what she sets out to do, but in these four minutes at least, she gets done. She orders Finster to start making putty patrollers, although at this point we don't really know why they're called that. An earthquake hits and we get our first glimpse of Alpha 5, Zordon and Alpha's teddy bear robot. Which is definitely a lost merchandising opportunity if you ask me. Zordon asks Alpha to transport five overbearing and over-emotional humans, or teenagers. Again, we're not too sure why teenagers exactly, but we shall not kink shame on this channel. They're transported to the command centre, which is actually a campus of the American Jewish University, which has been spliced onto a mountaintop. I guess that's a little easter egg from Chaim Saban. Well, no, not easter egg. That's not... Jew egg? No, that's Borat. You know what I mean. Once inside the command centre, Zordon explains that he is an interdimensional being trapped in a time warp. Which if you've seen my Power Rangers in Space video, you'll know I have issues with. But anyway, he explains that Rita Repulsa is planning to conquer Earth, and that the teenagers have been chosen to receive powers to lead the fight against her. With the use of their Dino Morphers, they will morph into the Power Rangers, each taking command of a Dino Zord. We won't get into too many debates about whether Zords are named after Zordon, I still believe they are, but feel free to disagree. Interestingly, the first version of the American Morphers don't have the black lightning bolts, they're actually all silver. But they don't actually look as good as this, they're more like the toy versions. Except the toy version had Mighty Morphin Power Rangers written in the red bands, rather than just Power Rangers. Even though the actual costume versions, which would be solid rubber, do actually have the black bolts. And in some episodes we even see close-ups of the Zhu Ranger morphers. Anyway, Jason, the Red Ranger, will command the Tyrannosaurus, Zack, the Black Ranger, just don't, we, we won't go there again, will command the Mastodon, Kimberly, the Pink Ranger, will command the Pterodactyl, Billy, the Blue Ranger, will command the Triceratops, and Trini, the Yellow Ranger, 
really, really don't, will command the Sabretooth Tiger. The Dino Zords can be combined to form Megazord, but our potential superheroes are not biting and leave. Meanwhile, Finster is still making putties out of putty and moulds them in a Monstermatic, which must have just been in space storage or something. And then the putties are sent down to fight. Now, while Jason, Trini, and Zack know how to fight, Zack with more of a dance based version of karate, and Kimberly is gymnastic enough to fake it, they're no match for the putties, so morph into the Power Rangers, but are then teleported back to Angel Grove as Rita is sent down Goldar. And this is still awesome. In order to crush these new Power Rangers, Rita throws down her wand to supersize Goldar. The Rangers call their Zords, which seem to be an impossibly long distance away. And annoyingly, rather than fighting Goldar with their individual Zords first, they skip straight to Megazord. We get a brief look of what it can do in tank mode, but it enters battle mode quite quickly and begins combat with Goldar. And I'm just putting it out there, this still looks better than CG. Having the models and then the suit still looks good. The only cheap looking bit is when they call for the power sword and they hand switch to human hands wearing silver gloves. Before they can destroy Goldar though, he retreats and the first battle is over. Back at the command center, Zordon lays out the basic rules. First, the rangers must never use their powers for personal gain. Never escalate a battle unless Rita forces them. And finally, keep their identities secret. In episode two, we learn that it was Rita that trapped Zordon in the time warp. And we also start to learn just how much of a genius Billy is. He's already managed to create communicators that work between the rangers and the command center, as well as also being able to teleport them there. The biggest thing though is that we get our first monster of the week. Finster creates the monsters out of putty, just like the putties, and bakes them in the Monstermatic to bring them to life. Rita also launches a time device, which looks suspiciously like the spaceship that the astronauts used in episode one. Only it's a, a miniature one. No other reference, I just like the way he says that. The reason for this is never explained, at least in the American version anyway, we're just meant to gloss over it, but it does make more sense when we get to the Japanese version, although it's a Sentai, so the word sense is a bit of a loose term. We're also meant to gloss over the fact that Rita created something that has the Japanese flag on it, and she sent it to Angel Grove, where seemingly every single person is Asian. It's actually not very important to the overall story, but the only reason that it's really worth mentioning is that when I first saw this at five years old, none of it seemed that weird to me. But I shall continue to overthink things anyway, because that's just what I do. This episode is interesting though, because they use rule two, never escalate a battle unless Rita forces you, to justify filming segments with the American cast fighting putties, rather than instantly morphing and just following the same storylines of the Japanese show. It's very clear that this is going to be an American show that uses Japanese footage, but isn't going to be dictated too much by the context of it. Something that I, and probably quite a lot of people, had always assumed was the case. This then sets the precedent for all subsequent episodes, and potentially to its detriment when looking at it with fresh eyes. Because the other thing that this show does is that it starts to follow a simple copy and paste narrative arc in many of the episodes. Rita sends down a monster or putties, the rangers struggle to handle them, so morph. The monster looks like he's going to be defeated, so Rita sends down her wand to make the monster grow, which makes the rangers call their zords. The zords form Megazord, and the monster is defeated. This formula would be used over and over again, rinse and repeat, nearly every week. Which is lazy, but kids like repetition, and it became a worldwide phenomenon that even snared me, and I'm still talking about it nearly 30 years later, so I guess it worked. This episode at least is a little bit different, as the monster of the week transports them to a time warp rather than fighting them on Earth. So is this the kind of place that Zordon is? I mean his actual physical form, not the floating head in a tube. It's our only real vision of what a time warp looks like. The idea of this is that Squat and Babu are to blow up the time device, definitely not a Japanese space shuttle, and trap them there. So again, is that how Zordon got trapped wherever he is? Rita just blew up his means of escape. 
It's here that we're introduced to the Power Blasters and also their dagger form. But then it gets very confusing, because Rita sends down a giant monster to Earth, presumably to cause destruction, but she also seemingly moves her headquarters to the top of a building, which the monster then punches a hole in it to somehow get to the time warp, and then pulls Jason out, but is then magically in a quarry. They clearly weren't too worried about putting too much thought into this episode, but at least I can answer my own question from the Jetman review, in that the reason why it's always in a quarry is that Tokyo filming permits are too expensive, and also generally blowing things up there is usually frowned upon. I do love the old school force perspective techniques here. They really do work, and they still hold up. Much better than CG does, even some series that are 20 years younger than this. I also love seeing the Tyrannosaurus fighting on its own here. You really don't get to see them fighting individually that often, but watching it back now highlights just how cool the Mighty Morphin era Zords were. All three seasons of them, particularly when the Zeo Zords were a bit weird, the Turbo Zords were all cars, and Power Rangers in Space didn't really have individual Zords to begin with. It's the Tyrannosaurus that probably gets the most individual screen time. Until the Dragon Zord appears later in the season, that is. But we'll get to that. We do actually get to see a good amount of this in Episode 3, with the Triceratops and Sabretooth Tiger having tail guns, the Triceratops having horn chains, the Mastodon having a freeze attack, and so on. And I'm just going to say it, the Pterodactyl is the best Zord. It's basically a dinosaur fighter plane, plus it's tough enough to be the Megazord's outer armour. What could be better than that? Episode 3 also introduces the Rangers' individual weapons. Billy gets a power lance, Kimberly a bow and arrow, Jason a sword, Zack a power axe, and Trini power daggers. And there's no question what's the best weapon here. Zack's axe cannon is the best thing ever. Bring all the weapons together, and they're able to destroy a, conveniently, now smaller, monster. In Episode 4 they introduce the Power Crystals, but it's never really explained what these are for exactly. It's something about sending the essence of the other Rangers' powers to Jason, but then they're buried in a quarry, even though we literally just saw the Rangers produce them. I think it's got something to do with Zordon being able to transport the crystals to Jason, which then allows the others to join him. But it's all a bit confusing, and now they're using the crystals like their joysticks for the Zords, even though they were able to control the Zords before this, and we literally see the crystals being used in Episode 1. Being a 90s American show, they try to add in some good moral storylines. For the kids. Like a deaf girl, who's initially made fun of, but she's able to evade a hypnotising monster to help save the day. And Trini, in particular, is an environmentalist, and is always trying to bring awareness to pollution and litter. In Episode 7, we're introduced to Billy's new project, a modified Volkswagen Beetle that can fly, and is capable of doing 0 to 3,000 miles per hour in under 3 seconds. Seriously, how is Billy still a high school student? He made a car that can fly, and do Mach 4. Not to mention, he also manages to help a kid invent modern day VR. Not as big a deal, I admit, but the point is, Billy should be the richest person alive by this point. This episode is interesting because it shows Sentai footage in the viewing globe, but Zordon mentioned something about power eggs. These are meant to be of great importance, created by the Morphing Masters, and yet this is the only episode where they're ever mentioned. They're just used to set up the Monster of the Week battle, but again, the eggs will make more sense later. To be honest, nothing really significant happens until around episode 13, where we learn of a new power. The Rangers are able to combine the power of all of their coins in order to give one Ranger all the other's individual powers. It's been done in many other series, but it's usually the Red Ranger, and we see more of a physically powered up version of him. But even then, not much really happens until we get to the all-important Green with Evil series of episodes. At a martial arts competition in the Youth Centre, a new kid has appeared as a rival for Jason. Rita spots him through her telescope and thinks he's the perfect candidate to become the new Green Ranger, an evil Power Ranger to counteract the powers of the other five. But before we get to that, the seeds are sown for a potential love story between this new kid Tommy and Kimberly. Rita sends down a few putties to test Tommy's skills, and after being convinced, she transports him to the moon and brainwashes him, 
giving him the powers of the Green Ranger and the sixth power coin. It's never really explained why Rita has the powers of the Green Ranger, although that's what they began to lay the groundwork for in the 2017 movie. In that universe, Rita and Zordon were both Power Rangers, so she possesses the green power coin. With the sixth power coin in hand, Tommy is able to enter the command centre and start wreaking havoc with Alpha and Zordon. With communications down, the Rangers take the Radbug to see what happened, only to discover the damage caused by the new Ranger, although no one knows it's Tommy at this point. Some of the recycling of footage becomes apparent here, because in episode 10 they talk about nasty night soldiers from another planet, but then they use the footage again when introducing the Sword of Darkness. They play the footage over Finster talking about the Nasty Knight defeating Zordon soldiers thousands of years ago, which doesn't make much sense as the sword can't be seen, but also it suggests that these aren't necessarily the original Power Rangers, because there's potentially someone who yielded Zack's axe before he did. However, that might act as an explanation for why Rita has the coin. There may have been a Green Ranger in the past, but the Nasty Knight defeated him, and Rita was presented with his sword, and also the power coin. That would have actually been better if they'd done that, because they probably could have used some of the Zhu Ranger footage when they're outside of their suits, and used it to create some more lore about Zordon and his first set of Rangers, before his eventual defeat and entrapment in a time warp. Although that's all a bit of a mess anyway, because it's never clear how Rita was trapped in the dumpster by Zordon, but Zordon was trapped in the Time Warp by Rita. How can both be true? And as a side note, this confirms the theory about Zordon and his tube. As they try to fix the damage caused by the Green Ranger, they attempt to locate a live feed for Zordon. He appears briefly, trying to explain where he is. The audio is broken, so you can't quite tell what he's saying, but he does say that he's in a certain sector of a certain system. We later hear Sector Q9, wherever that is, but essentially Zordon is physically somewhere and somewhen, but he's not in the tube, making the whole thing with in space as confusing as I always thought it was. There's an interdimensional power surge when trying to locate him, temporarily removing the Ranger's ability to morph. Although, to be fair, Tommy tries to use the command center's equipment to send Zordon to another dimension, so who knows quite what's going on there. It's maybe got something to do with being able to contact them by only using the morphing grid, or something? I don't know. But anyway, Tommy sets out to destroy the Power Rangers, starting with Jason, using his power coin to trap him with Goldar at Rita's HQ. And this is the first time that we really get to see the difference between the Japanese Green Ranger costume and the American version. The shade of green is lighter in the US footage, but the big difference is the much cheaper gold breastplates. In part 3 of Green with Evil, we're introduced to Scorpina. I was always a bit confused by Scorpina, partly because it's like Kimberly was nice girl Sandy, but Scorpina was edgy Sandy, which for a five-year-old boy just starting to realise that he's straight, was an interesting time for many of my generation's psychosexual development. And that's probably the first time I've used my psychology degree since I got it. But also, I think about everyone assumed straight from her introduction that she was Guldar's girlfriend. The designs of the two are just too similar to pretend that their stories aren't connected somehow, but without knowing anything about the Japanese show's equivalent, we were just left to assume. In the main battle, Alpha manages to trick Tommy, trapping him in a force field inside the command centre, while the rest of the Rangers battle Guldar and Scorpina, but Rita is able to release him, turning him giant. And I still remember the disbelief at seeing the Zords being cast into the fire. I wasn't to know that we weren't even halfway through the season yet. Five-year-old me honestly thought this was the end. While the Rangers regroup, Alpha reveals that the computer has managed to identify the Green Ranger as Tommy, while Ernie, Bulk, Skull and many of the other teenagers watch Guldar's destruction of Angel Grove on TV. And luckily, not everyone is worried. Many are just going about their daily lives, playing arcade games with not a care in the world for the giant gold monkey blowing up buildings downtown. But it turns out that Rita has been biding her time so that she can revive the Dragon Zord, a new Zord for the Green Ranger to be controlled by one of my favourite toys of all time, the Dragon Zord Flute Dagger... thing. Thankfully, Zordon is located by Alpha, and his return also brings the revival of the Zords from the lava that they fell into. 
because... A wizard did it. Ah, for glaming out that. We switch to some more Japanese footage as Jason fights Tommy to destroy his sword and free him from Rita's spell. Although the switch to American footage is really jarring because Jason is at least twice the size of the Japanese actor and Trini is so much skinnier. But even so, there was nothing cooler than this first Six Ranger morph sequence and the formation of the Dragon Zords fighting formation. And now five-year-old me's head was exploding because Jason was always my favourite, but now the Green Ranger comes along and he has the shield, the, the dagger, the gold morpher, the Dragon Zord, and oh, he's so cool! In episode 26, Rita upgrades the putties to super putties that can remould themselves, so Zordon sends Jason and Tommy to find some new weapons, but they're confronted by a new Brachiosaurus Zord. The two have to work together, even sharing their weapons, in order to retrieve the new Zhu Ranger branded blasters. But the putties don't seem too much trouble beyond this point, even though the new zappers don't actually make another appearance. And it turns out that the new Zord, Titanus, is actually on their side. Zordon was just using it to get Tommy and Jason to work together, rather than butt heads as the two alpha males in the team. And then in episode 27, we get our first look at Ultra Zord. But then it disappears again just as quickly as it appears. In reality, it's just a refresh of the Megazord sequence. For the next few episodes, it's just a new means of destroying the monster in its grown form. The season gets a little messy here, as they're clearly trying hard to adapt stuff from Zhu Ranger, but things just come and go and never really get explained. Like the introduction of Lokar, a supposed ally of Rita's, but we don't really know who he is. He sends the rangers to an island, which I guess is also meant to be like what happened to Zordon. They're just transported somewhere that isn't necessarily in the same dimension. But then I guess they just wait around for the rangers to figure out how to escape, before forming Mega Dragon Zord, Ultra Zord, and then Lokar disappears. And Lokar doesn't appear again for another 10 episodes, but the episode is just all over the place. It has Goldar and a Zord of his own, and Titanus is supposedly destroyed, but then Lokar is brought back, this time with scars all over his face. And then the Zords are supposedly destroyed, again, but really they've just returned to where they came from to re-energise. Only that's meant to take 12 hours, but they're back almost instantly, and Titanus also just magically reappears too. There's also the old staple of evil rangers. But how exactly? The whole thing with Rita having a power coin because she previously defeated an earlier iteration of the rangers would make sense, but being able to just conjure up another set of rangers, why would she not just make loads of them? Why only make five of them? And why not make another evil green ranger? While I still love this series, you do get the sense that some episodes were just thrown together and that logic isn't very important. We continue with some filler episodes, but when we get to the two-part Green Candle episodes, we see that Rita does actually still have a hold over Tommy, and in order to prevent him losing his powers, he's forced to pass his power coin to Jason. But we also get the continuation of the Kimberly tommy love story with their first kiss. For the next few episodes, Jason is also in control of the Dragon Zord, although again, Rita still has somewhat of a hold over its power. But either way, Jason now wields the powers of both the Red and the Green Ranger. It only really comes to a head when Rita manages to influence Billy to steal the Dragon Dagger, putting the Dragon Zord into the hands of Goldar, and then the Rangers agree to hand over their power coins in order to save their trapped parents. And we get to see that they're actually the toy coins with the little plastic clips on the side, they're not the metal coins that we use in Zhu Ranger. However, Goldar forgets to ask for the Green Ranger's coin, so Zordon offers to infuse Tommy with some of his own powers, somehow, even though we know he's not actually in the tube, but I guess it must have something to do with drawing power from the morphing grid again, or something. Either way, the Green Ranger returns, cuddly toy breastplate and all. He's able to grab a poor attempt at the Dragon Dagger prop, and take back control of the Dragon Zord, which leaves the Power Coins unguarded long enough for him to return them to the other Rangers, which the Rangers then use to repower Zordon, somehow, and then Tommy is also fully repowered, somehow. But the bottom line is Tommy is now back, but his powers may not be back permanently. 
According to Zordon, each time he uses his powers, they will weaken further, and we know from Season 2 that the powers of the Green Ranger do eventually fail. When we get to the final episodes of the season, firstly, Goldar's mouth is fixed, as it had previously been broken when it was first shipped over, but we also get another episode with evil versions of the Rangers. But thankfully they're beaten by upgraded weapons that conveniently look exactly the same as the old ones, although it was interesting to see giant clone rangers fighting against the Zords. In the season finale, all but Zack and Tommy are frozen by Rita and her monster, and with Tommy's powers still a bit uncertain, Zack becomes the third ranger to wear the gold armour. And while it is pretty cool to see that, honestly it's a pretty nothing episode. And that's kind of it. There's no real blowout to the ending of the season. That's more reserved for the opening of Season 2, with the switch to using the Thunder Zords. But the reason being is that there isn't much of a break between the two seasons. There's only two months between the end of Season 1 and the start of Season 2, at least in the US anyway. So it feels like a bit of a letdown if you just take it on face value, but I guess they assume that there was no need to have a special ending, given that they were going straight into Season 2 anyway. And it wasn't clear at that point what they were going to do, either. They wanted to keep the Zhu Ranger aesthetic for the next season, so they commissioned new footage, but then they started embracing certain elements from Die Ranger anyway. But that's another story, and one we've covered before. Watching it back, you realise that Mighty Morphin does have some of the weirdest monsters, like Shellshock, a turtle with traffic lights sticking out of its head. Although to be fair to it, it's recognised in the show as a particularly weird monster, as it was created by Squat and Babu, not Rita and Finster. In terms of footage of the villains, obviously there's a difficulty of making sure that characters like Rita can be dubbed over without it being too obvious that she's not speaking English, but they actually do a pretty good job of it. It's Goldar that's the most inconsistent, and I don't just mean in terms of getting the timing right with pre-existing footage. His voice noticeably changes from episode to episode. I ambush them with putties, then finish them with a monster before their friends can help. Power geeks think they've beaten me, but I'll be back and they'll be sorry. Although Zordon's voice also changes on occasion too. I'll contact the Rangers. Prepare to teleport them to Zack's location. A new chapter has begun, Rangers. Let the power protect you. But otherwise, watching this show back reminds me just how good this cast was. Each person brought their own flavour to it. Kimberly was a gymnast, Jason was the natural martial artist, Billy was the genius, Trini brought more of a kung fu style, and then Zack had his hip-hop kido. It's one of the reasons why the 2017 film felt a bit flat to me, is that the characters didn't bring enough of their own personalities. But also, as much as I liked Rocky, Adam and Aisha, they didn't bring much of the same level of uniqueness either. However, if you were to watch the original pilot, you'd be left with a few questions about whether the cast was the right one at all. While I think they made the right call with Twee Trang as Trini, I did kind of like the original actress, but they made Billy an even bigger nerd, Kimberly was even more of a California girl stereotype, and Austin St. John's acting… well… Trasaurus. I realised a while ago that I love the concept of the younger superheroes, because they have to balance the concepts of finding themselves as human beings, and also as superheroes. That's why some of my favourites are Spider-Man and Supergirl. Yes, they're superheroes, but they also need to balance just being teenagers. But unlike, say, Mega Ranger, Power Rangers doesn't really do a good enough job of it. Yes, they do show them in school, and they do show family members occasionally, but realistically it's not shown as much as it could have been. Everything is just rushed through to get to the destruction of the Monster of the Week. The one exception to the rule of monsters being destroyed is Episode 9's Mr. Tickle Sneezer, Trini's creepy doll brought to life by Rita. Although that might have all been a dream, I'm not too sure. The reason being is that in Zhu Ranger, he's not a monster. He's a folklore fairy dwarf who got caught up in Bandora's affairs, and there's not a whole lot of footage that can be carried over, because it's all very specific to the Japanese show, but we'll get to that in due time. But I'll leave it to Kimberly to summarise the overall feel for this show. This is so 90s! <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's glorious. 
It's still one of my favourite series, and it has the best soundtrack that any show could ever ask for. The thing is though, it's 60 episodes long, and watching it all in one sitting, it kind of drags. But let's not waste too much time, let's move on to see what Zhu Ranger has to offer. Now obviously, if you watch the old video, you have some sort of an idea where this sits in the history of Super Sentai, so we can skip over a bit of the preamble and dive straight into the meat and potatoes of it all, but this time with all the trimmings. The series starts off with news of a Japanese space shuttle that has left Earth for the planet Nemesis, one that apparently comes close enough to Earth every 23 million years. You'd be forgiven for thinking that it would still have to be outside of our solar system, but we'll gloss over the fact that I don't think it is, and that it would take about 78,000 years to reach the nearest star. But after watching Lost Galaxy, my propensity to apply logic to any and all aspects of space has diminished slightly, so I'll be doing my best to just go with it. Pushing the boundaries of astrophysics that bit further, the astronauts are being joined on the trip by two young children, Satoru and Yumiko. It's not actually explained why they're going along for the trip, maybe it was a Nintendo Power drawing competition? Who knows, but don't get too attached to them, they're not around for very long. As they approach the planet, an old man, who we'd seen sweeping the front of an apartment block, climbs to the top and… I'm sorry, what now? Before it can be explained though, we cut back to Nemesis, where the astronauts have landed and begun to explore the terrain. We see that Nemesis is currently placed just behind our moon, which is fine. That wouldn't cause any devastation at all, and it's fine that the astronauts are in modified beekeeper suits. They find a container with a glowing red stone on top, and open it to release Bookback, Totopat, Pleprecorn, although sometimes I think it's pronounced Pully Pully Can, Griforza, and seemingly Madonna's grandmother, Bandora. Apparently they've been in the container for just over 170 million years, and as a thank you for releasing her, Bandora sends the astronauts flying off into space, presumably to their death. I mean, we're four and a half minutes in and someone's already been killed. To make up for lost time, she starts destroying cities on Earth, or at least one city in Japan, and then a skyscraper heads out into space, returning with Bandora's palace atop it, and presumably many thousands of dead people inside who were just unwittingly pulled into space. She monologues about her motives, which are kind of the classic humans are flawed and a danger to themselves, so the only obvious solution is to destroy them. Shtick. The man who we saw sweeping earlier turns out to be an old rival of hers, the White Wizard Barza. We also start to establish her hatred of children, starting with those that were randomly taken up in space in the shuttle. Barza, however, has a few tricks up his sleeve, and enters a secret combination in the lift to reach a hidden temple and revive ancient warriors who have been suspended in animation. And we're introduced to Goshi, Boy, Mei, and Dan. But the Red Ranger will have to wait, as Barza manages to break the key, trying to revive him. The other rangers head to Bandora's palace, but are tricked and transported to the ocean. It's here we get our first glimpse of what we would know as the putties, but in hand puppet form. Bandora breaks out all the early 90s special effects and transports them into her palace, nearly killing them. That is, until Geki is finally released and comes to their aid. Now at this point it's worth pointing out that they're not able to transform, or henshin, or as I've mispronounced before, henji. Roll back your anger. At this point they're just the ancient warriors, and their weapons are relatively basic too. It's not until Barza tosses them their medals that they're able to activate their dino bucklers and transform into the rangers that we would recognise. But of course in this version the yellow ranger is not female like Trini, he's male, and ironically or not, called Boy. It's interesting though that when they're battling the putties, they're actually a bit more formidable than their American counterparts, as they're able to reform themselves after being destroyed, as, after all, they're made of putty. There's a brief interlude at this point in order to go through the backstory of how we got to where we are. 170 million years ago, humans and dinosaurs lived alongside each other and developed their own civilization. 
This was made up of five clans, each with their own dinosaur guardian. The Tyrannosaurus, the Mammoth, the Sabertooth Tiger, the Triceratops and the Pterodactyl. Now obviously these aren't all dinosaurs, but we can kind of forgive it in the Japanese show a bit because they mix up ancient history to the point where the definition of prehistoric animals is a bit skewed. In Power Rangers though, there's not really that excuse. It's just that it's the 90s and dinosaurs were big business, so they're dinosaurs, even when they're not. Don't ask questions, just buy the merch. Bandora then appeared with the aim of destroying everything, although we don't quite know why yet, and a great battle ensued, killing Geki's whole family. But with the help of the Guardian Beasts, they were able to seal Bandora away, and that's where she stayed ever since. Fearing that one day she may return, a warrior from each clan was placed into an ages long slumber until they would be needed again. Meanwhile, Bandora and her crew have moved from her palace atop the skyscraper to the moon, and it's here that Plepricorn has set up his clay workshop in which the monsters of the week are to be made, just as they are in Power Rangers. She uses the space shuttle to draw out the rangers, cue obligatory upskirt shot, because Japan, and then the latest monster is also sent down. But there's something I didn't spot before, and it's very confusing in and of itself, but also when you know how the season ends, and that is that Plepricorn is apparently a Christian, or perhaps a Catholic, crossing himself and wishing his monster Godspeed. Hold on to that thought for later. In fact, in these early episodes, there are hints of things that will become important later on, or at least act as a bit of subtle foreshadowing. When the Rangers are in trouble, we get our first glimpse of the returning Tyrannosaurus, which Geki is able to use to destroy a monster we saw in episode one, but for the moment, this is the only returning Guardian Beast. In the meantime, the Rangers need to forge new weapons as their current ones appear to be breaking. Luckily, some already exist. Thousands of years before this generation of Guardians, a five-headed King Ghidorah-style monster was slain, and from it came five legendary weapons, which coincidentally all happen to coincide with our current Rangers specialties. They must travel to a castle in the Land of Despair to retrieve them, although in their current forms they look nothing like the weapons that we would recognise from Power Rangers. It's in this episode that Bandora first uses her wand to make a monster grow, but unlike in the American version, it takes an extra step to establish her as evil. Rather than it just being a wand that makes it grow, she specifically calls on the help of evil spirits. As such, the Rangers all call upon the five Guardian Beasts to join the fight. At this point, however, they're not able to merge together, so fight using their individual powers. They manage to retrieve the weapons, but again at this stage, they're not the same as we would recognise. It's only when they transform that the weapons also are able to transform. Once they've done so, they can be combined to form the Howling Cannon. In some of these early episodes, you also see where the American show had to mash a few bits of footage together, mix a few things up, or rely on more bespoke footage, as some monsters, like the Sphinx, actually appear in a different form more than the form that we would recognise. For example, in the US show they can form Megazord pretty much straight away, and they also have the crystals, but then do an introduction to getting the crystals anyway, they just hope that you don't realise the broken continuity. The Red Ranger is somewhere out of their reach, so the crystals help the other rangers find him. Or something. Whereas in Zhu Ranger, the Red Ranger is transported to a dream world where the Guardian Beasts speak to him of the colossal Dino Tanker and Daijujin. When he returns, his sword reveals the location of the Dino Crystals, which release the other Rangers from their imprisonment by Sphinx, and now they're able to each use the crystals, which allows the Guardian Beasts to combine, first into the Dino Tanker and then Daijujin. In episode 8, the same episode where we would see Pudgy Pig, we're introduced to Gnome, the Guardian of the Woods and also an ally of Barza, but more on him later. In episode 9, we're introduced to Baron Crockle, his wife Daisy and Prince Yoro of the Apello tribe, who all arrive in the VW Beetle that we would recognise as the Radbug. It turns out that not only were the rangers suspended in their slumber, but two dinosaur eggs were also hidden, in the hope that one day they'd be able to flourish again, as they were all but wiped out by Bandora. 
The tribe found the eggs, but Bandora came for them, so the Guardian Beasts appeared before them and informed them that they should seek out the Zhu Rangers. And again, there's some pseudo-Christian overtones, as the people of this tribe aren't human as such. They were, but they were the guardians of a forbidden fruit, before being tricked into eating it by a monster, and were then punished by being turned into monkeys. Now they guard the eggs, with the promise of being returned to how they used to be. It's not exactly the same as the Garden of Eden, but still, these warped references do add up to something later. But it's odd, because it turns out that their gods are actually the guardian beasts. Anyway, it gets a bit complicated, but the eggs are lost and won't be found again until much later in the season. In episode 15, we see the footage used in Power Rangers as a reference to Zordon's past warriors. In this case, it's Goshi fighting one of Bandora's monsters. But in this instance, the sword that's created for him is not the same sword that is used for the Green Ranger, it's just a one-off for the Monster of the Week. I assume they couldn't use all of the battle footage from this episode, as it also includes a child entering Daijujin. So instead they just merged a few episodes worth of footage together into the Green with Evil arc, which does actually have a lot of bespoke US footage shot for it too. When we get to episode 17, we have a very different take on the introduction of the Green Ranger. Gnome returns, but his grandson has removed a key from its hiding place. The key can be used to revive Borai, Sixth Ranger, who is still asleep. Only Gnome and Barza try to catch the boy, as they don't want Borai to be revived, but they refuse to say why. Either way, Borai is revived, using footage that we have actually seen in Power Rangers, but he immediately attacks the other rangers. As a side note, he's referred to as the Dragon Ranger, as his guardian beast is a dragon, which, from a folklore point of view, actually makes more sense than the dinosaurs do. Although it's less clear where his dino buckler and other accoutrements came from, if he sealed himself away rather than a tribal leader. But he also refers to himself as the prince of the same tribe as Geki. It's revealed that Borai is actually Geki's older brother, and that the people that Geki thought were his parents actually weren't. The king and queen weren't able to have children of their own, so adopted Geki from a family within the tribe when he was a baby. Their birth father later led a rebellion, but was killed, using his last words to tell Borai to avenge him. However, Bandora has already killed the king, so as their heir to the throne, Borai's hatred is aimed towards Geki. Which obviously plays into Bandora's hands, who begins to celebrate, cue the best Eurovision song that there never was. But the celebrations are premature, as Borai is not interested in working with her. As a gesture of goodwill, she offers him a sword, which is not the same one from a few episodes ago, even though, as I say, they merged them in Power Rangers. Geki initially refuses to fight Borai, forcing Daijujin to appear and insist. This is our first real look at Daijujin as more than just a robot. We'd seen the Guardian Beasts as being sentient, and even considered gods by some, but we haven't seen Daijujin as a separate being with his own individual sentience. Although, we take a break from the storyline in episode 19 to introduce Lammy, or Scorpina as we would know her. Although in this version, there's no mistaking the connection between her and Griforza. She's his wife, and she's now part of the villain lineup until the end of the season. But not only that, the dinosaur eggs have also been found. But here's where probably the biggest plot hole of the series comes. Bandora sets a trap that's designed to simultaneously kill some kids, obviously it's a sentai, to destroy the dinosaur eggs, and also to destroy Daijujin. But her plan relies on a solar eclipse removing Daijujin's power. But if that's the case, literally the only thing Bandora would need to do is attack at night. In Power Rangers, they get around this by Megazord just being depleted of energy and unable to top it back up during the eclipse. But in Zhu Ranger, it's just taken as a prerequisite that as soon as the sun disappears, he'll be destroyed because he becomes weak. But either way, Daijujun is actually defeated and falls to his doom. And although Borai has been tolerating Bandora up to this point, once Daijujin is out of the way, he tries to kill her so that he can take over Earth instead of her. 
She casts him down to Earth, but a spirit guide takes him to a time warp and informs him that he only has 30 hours to live. While inside the time warp, he won't age, but outside of it, time will continue to tick down. He also hands him his Dragon Dagger, which can be used to bring forth his guardian beast, Dragon Caesar, which is absolutely modelled on Godzilla. Insert cheap plug to go watch my Godzilla video. The thing is though, the Guardian Beasts then return because Barza appeals to the gods of the Guardian Beasts, even though the beasts themselves are sometimes looked at as gods. But that's not what actually brings them back. It's that they're not actually solar powered after all. It's just that solar energy contains something else that is the source of their power, but it's not exclusively found in solar energy. It's also, conveniently, found in large quantities in magma. So they weren't destroyed at all, in fact they're arguably more powered up now. Which is dumb, but whatever, they're back now. And Geki is done with Borai sh** and finally agrees to fight him. Daijujin appears and once again tells Geki to kill Borai, but again he refuses. Borai also can't bring himself to kill his own brother and the two forgive each other, with Borai joining the lineup as the sixth ranger. As a result, Dragon Caesar can now combine with three of the other Guardian Beasts to form Goyujin. And not long after that, we're introducing King Brachian, or Titanus to us. But at first Brachian attacks them, forcing Borai and Geki to share weapons and armour in order to reach a new set of weapons, the Thunderslingers. Which you do briefly see in Power Rangers, but they're not utilised as much as in Dew Ranger. But Brachian is not on side just yet. It's when we get to episode 30 that some of those early Christian references start to make a bit more sense. Because you see, the ultimate villain in this show is not Bandora, it's Satan. Which as an ultimate villain, sure, but for a kid's show, yeah, I can kind of see why that wouldn't make it to Power Rangers. Lokar was a lot tamer in comparison. Barza mentions that Satan had been defeated by Kai, although no mention of who that is at this point. Bandora is trying to resurrect him by sacrificing children, and yeah, this is definitely a Sentai now. We then learn that Borai actually died when he was in his slumber. Daijujin used the spirit to bring him back to life, but only a shortened life. In contrast to what Barza just said, Klu Klux Clotho explains that it was actually Ultimate Daijujin that defeated Satan, but he was injured and the six rangers are needed to restore him and combine with Dragon Caesar to form Jute Daijujin. It's here that Brachian does actually become part of the team and allows the rangers to form Ultimate Daijujin, the being that once defeated Satan and defeats him once again. But that's not the last we'll see of him. There's still 20 episodes to fill, and fill is the word, not much happens for the next half a dozen episodes or so. It's only in episode 37 that the dinosaur eggs resurface again, and they're entrusted to King Brachian. But it's not until episode 42 that Borai eventually dies. Bandora uses a monster to mimic some of the Guardian Beasts, drawing Borai out and destroying the room in which time stands still in order to run out his remaining time on Earth as well as also making everyone think that the rangers are responsible for all the destruction of the city. He dies, passing on his shield and dagger to Geki, and his death leaves Dragon Caesar distraught and unwilling to submit to his brother. Although eventually Geki is able to wield the powers of both the red and green rangers, just as Jason was. Although things don't get too much better when Bandora uses the old Sentai staple of imposter rangers to make everyone hate them even more. Although thankfully it's all forgotten by the end of the episode because plot convenience. Anyway, we fast forward to the end of the season and the return of Kai, the being that we were originally told defeated Satan, but he didn't because that was Jesus. I mean, ultimate Daijujin. Wait, does the Bible have Megazord in it? I mean, Barza finds an additional book that talks about a final battle between the gods and Satan that causes an apocalypse. So basically he finds the Book of Revelations, but with dinosaurs. But as it turns out, this is actually the plot twist that we've been waiting for all along, because Kai is Bandora's son. Back in dino times he was being a d and breaking dinosaur eggs, 
until the mother came along and he ended up falling to his death. Kai's mother, who became Bandora, sold her soul to the devil in order to revive her son. As such, she is cursed to be a witch for all eternity. It also explains her hatred of dinosaurs and children. But of course, anyone who's seen Bedazzled will be able to tell you that the devil has a way of turning your wishes against you. And although Kai has been revived, he has no love for his mother, only Satan. And although it initially seems like Bandora has defeated all of the Guardian Beasts, the spirit of Borai appears, definitely not dangling on strings, and tells the rangers where to find them. With the formation of Ultimate Mega Jesus, both Kai and Satan are defeated. With Kai's death, Bandora's bond to the devil is broken and she loses her powers. Daijujin then seals her away, once again, and casts her out into space. And not only that, her hatred of children is also broken when Lamy and Graforza announce that they've had a baby. Brachian then returns the eggs, just in time for them to hatch, and a new age of dinosaurs, or at least Tyrannosauruses, can begin. With their jobs complete, Barza and the Rangers ascend to heaven. So I guess they kind of were Easter eggs after all. I mean, in many ways, the show carries a very Christian message even down to more subtle things like a monster who isn't evil being tricked into fighting the rangers, and then they take the time to bury it afterwards and adorn the grave with a cross. There's also the reference to the Garden of Eden, people are praying to God, and the ultimate morals of the story are that making deals with the devil will always backfire and that love will always prevail. You'd be forgiven for thinking that the show was actually specifically designed to carry a pseudo-Christian message, but it could also be that they were using references to Christianity as just another form of folklore inspiration. It's a bit hard to tell when you look at it from a Western perspective, because at the end of the day, the theme of this show is folklore. Unlike in Power Rangers, there is somewhat of a connection between the monsters because of this, although not all of them. Many of them are based on different folklore from around the world, as opposed to, say, Kaku Ranger, for example, where it's all based on Japanese folklore. Although the weird mix of folklore and classic literature that draws from all over the place makes a little bit more sense in Jiu Ranger when you start to encounter things like the Frankenstein monster, and then there's also episodes with vampires and other classic monsters. Power Rangers gets away with it by using it as an excuse for a Halloween party themed episode, but it still stands out. They even reference things like Sleeping Beauty and Aladdin. A more subtle change between this and the US show that you might not even notice is that the American footage of the Putty Patrollers seem to have removed the belts that the Golem soldiers used. Now, I can only assume that this is because it sports a five-pointed star, so maybe American producers were too worried that this design choice was based on the satanic nature of Bandora's motivation. I don't really know, but it would make sense even though that notion isn't carried over into Power Rangers, and also they still use some of the Japanese footage of the putties anyway. But actually the name Golem is another folklore reference, in this case Jewish folklore. No relation to Jew Ranger, even though that is the joke Chaim Saban uses. Golems are clay creatures brought to life, but can sometimes be heroes or villains depending on the story but they're often depicted with stars on them, regardless of whether it's five points or six. So technically speaking, I suppose all of the monsters are golems because they're all made out of clay. And it's actually more likely a Jewish thing than a satanic thing. One of the biggest differences is, again, something you'd probably overlook on first glance, and that is the soundtrack. The Power Rangers soundtrack, and also the accompanying Foley, is so much better than in Jew Ranger. Power Rangers footage still excites me more than its original counterpart, but it's all down to the superior sound. While there's the occasional mirrored episode, like the episodes where Billy and Kimberly are turned punk from Babu's potion, and the episode where May and Dan are turned punk with some potion by Totopat, realistically there's not that many. Obviously the monsters are more or less the same, but there's not a whole lot of storyline crossover, and it's actually quite strange how much they don't use. For example, there's loads of footage of Lamy, or Scorpina, that could have been used, but they never do. Considering they had to commission new footage from Japan anyway, it seems a bit of a waste that they don't use all that they could. 
And as I mentioned earlier, in Power Rangers, they seem to use the toys as their morphers. And in Zhu Ranger, the Dino Bucklers also appear to be the toys, but when a close-up of the coin is required, they swap it out for something a bit more substantial. So even though they're using something cheap and plastic, they're able to make it seem a bit more impressive for certain shots, which is something Power Rangers didn't do. One thing that does seem weird is that Griforza, or the Japanese Gul'dar, is unable to speak for a large proportion of the show, and even when he does get the ability to speak, he hardly uses it. Hence why we have the footage of Gul'dar with a broken mouth, as there's a severe lack of footage from Zhu Ranger. And while the actor who played Borai had actually been in Sentai before, for much of this series, Borai's time is limited, so footage of him is also limited, which is tricky for Power Rangers because Tommy became one of the most popular characters. So, as before, Power Rangers and Zhu Ranger are nothing alike. There's no denying that the Japanese show has more depth to it. Power Rangers is a fairly rinse and repeat show, but I'm not sure the whole folklore thing really does it for me. Don't get me wrong, as a Power Rangers fan, I still enjoyed the show, but comparing it to others that we've covered now, it's not my favourite. But either way, if you were a fan of the original series, I'd still say that Zhu Ranger is mandatory viewing. But you know what? Before we wrap this up, there is one more thing we need to mention, and that is a home video release from Japan. This is essentially a clip show, and kind of a marketing video too, that is fronted by a hand puppet called Dino, and features all of the rangers talking through the season. There's not a whole lot to mention about this, apart from the fact that all of the Guardian Beasts seem to have their own theme tunes. But anyway, I'm glad we could finally go back and do this properly, and talk through the bits that we glossed over in the first video. But until next time, in the words of Zordon, May the power protect you. <laughs>